Well, good afternoon. What a great, great two days. I am Miguel Howe, and I am the April and Jay Graham Fellow here at the George W. Bush Institute. And at the Bush Institute, we know that by fostering a successful transition for our nation's veterans, we enable a generation of resourceful, determined, and experienced leaders who will continue to serve in new and meaningful ways for the decades to come. As our military service members and their families transition to civilian life, as you heard from Matt, as charged by our 43rd Commander-in-Chief, they have a new leadership assignment to continue to contribute to the security, the economy, and the sustained health of our democracy as veterans. So, Blaine, Lila, you are two of those post-9-11 veterans who have, have come home. Um, and there are four million of our citizens and residents who have, who have had that same service. 200,000 of our service members transition into civilian life every year. And, and, you know, oftentimes we see them lifted up either as heroes or sometimes seen as victims. Um, but I want to ask you both, um, what, how do you see your fellow post 9-11 veterans leading and serving today? Sure, so I think the first thing to maybe point out is that the military is a very diverse place. And so a veteran is not a veteran is not a veteran. They, they came from different places, they served in different ways, their experiences were different. Um, and so what they need and how they can contribute and how they feel when they exit the military is, is also going to be very diverse. So I think that's the first thing that we have to recognize is that we can't just say veteran and assume that means one thing or some small list of things. It's a, it's a cross section of America and that's one of the things that makes it so great as that General Pace pointed out. But in terms of how I see them contributing post-service, it's also in a very diverse set of ways and so there are ways that we can point to that are very recognizable. You see guys like Jake Wood leading Team Rubicon and JJ Pinter leading Team RWB and you see people like Alex Gorski leading Johnson & Johnson, right? So you see people that are in the public eye that are doing things that are making a huge impact and we can recognize it. But I think probably more importantly, there are a lot of veterans that are coming home, taking off the uniform and they're going to work to put food on the table to feed their family, to make businesses better, to make their communities better, whether that's in a professional setting or in a civic setting. And I'll, just one anecdote, when I, when I left the military, I went to work in corporate America. I got a job, I was very fortunate to have some people usher me into a good job at Quest Diagnostics, which is a big corporation, and they gave me a job doing something I had never done before in my life. And the only reason I was able to have that opportunity and have that job is because there were six or seven military veterans who had gone to work there over the previous three or four years and had just been killing it, right? And so they were willing to now not only accept a military veteran into their ranks and take a little bit of a chance on me, they were actually getting to the point where they were eagerly starting to recruit and pursue military veterans to come in only because other veterans had gone before and had not been entitled, had not expected anything other than an opportunity to make their sales number or lead their team or contribute to the success of the business. And so they didn't look at me as much of a risk. And as a result, I got an awesome job and I was able to transition out smoothly from a professional perspective. And then, then I did a good job at the organization and it sort of continues the cycle. And so they're doing it in a lot of ways, but one of the most important ways is just to go out, go to work every day and, and lead by example. Which really speaks to the responsibility that veterans learn in uniform and need to bring, uh, bring back to our nation. And so, you know, you said all veterans are unique. You know, Lila, before you answer that question, can you share a little bit about your veteran and American story? and then also talk about how and where you see veterans. Sure, are. sure. So I'm, a, I'm an Afghan immigrant whose family came to the United States during the anti-Soviet jihad time frame in the 1980s. And I have an older brother who is in the military who's retired now, have a sister-in-law who's still on active duty, so we're very much a military family. And it was, joining the military was a way to absolutely pick ourselves up by our bootstraps as immigrants. and. We have created phenomenal lives for each other and then been able to impact uh, many other people as a result. Um, how I see veterans serving, and I absolutely agree with, with Blaine, is they're, they're taking the, the leadership that they've learned and applying it every day, wherever they are. But I'm also very 
um, encouraged by the veterans that I see in the advocacy space. Uh, and so I'm glad that there are more veterans that are running for office. I'm glad to see more women veterans running for office. I'm glad to see that there is an increase in the number of women veterans that are starting businesses in this country and contributing somewhere around $20 billion to our economy. Um, I'm excited to see more veterans coming out and talking about immigration and why we should protect refugees that come to this, to this country. And the way that I see them leading is pragmatically and collaboratively. So veterans are doing more to come together with other veterans, but also non-veterans. And we're well poised to do this because in the military, as you mentioned, we come from all diverse walks of life and we have to work together and we very quickly learn to work on teams with people who are different from us. And when we're deployed in different parts of the world, we often have to work with people who are very different from us. And so when you have veterans coming into this advocacy space and saying enough is enough with the polarization, we need to work together, we need to come together to live our values, the values that we have fought for, I think we're extremely well poised to bring the country back together in a way that perhaps other sectors of society cannot. So last fall, President Bush issued a very important address at this moment in time for our country on the spirit of liberty at home and in the world, addressing freedom, free markets, and security. He called for projecting American leadership abroad, hardening our defenses at home, strengthening American citizenship, as we've heard over the course of the past two days, and restoring trust in democratic institutions, also something that we've been discussing over the past two days. So I'd like to start with General Pace and Lila in terms of how can our veterans meet those first two imperatives, help to harden our defenses at home after they take off their uniform and to continue to project American leadership abroad? Sir, please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as Lila and Blaine have already pointed out, the beauty of our armed forces is it's a, it's just a melting pot. Uh, in, in your Marine Corps, we, we don't have black Marines or white Marines. We have light green Marines and dark green Marines. <laughs> uh, because it's all about being green. It's all about being a Marine. And, and I think in all of our armed forces, all of the biases that you might bring with you from whatever community you came melt away when faced with the kind of dangers that are being faced. And that knowledge, that understanding, having lived in a homogeneous community called the military, can be transferred directly back to civilian society as examples of how to be a good partner with somebody of a different religion or a different skin color, just as fundamental human decency. But they bring back incredible skills. They bring back, as I said, the knowledge of the strength of this country and how lucky we are to be living here. But when you deploy overseas, we don't deploy to Paris. We don't deploy to Barcelona. We deploy to Mogadishu. We deploy to Bag Bagram and Baghdad. What that means is every night you go to sleep, you are saying to yourself, man, I cannot wait to get home because you realize how precious what we have here in the United States is. So you bring that home with you as well, and you share that with your fellow citizens. And if you get out, you might be able to help in technical fields, law enforcement, teaching, mentoring, coaching, you name it. Any walk of life in this country. And that strengthens us here at home. And as some of the folks have talked about here on the stage earlier today, there is a real problem in our nation right now with extremes. And folks in the military have learned, if they came with extremes, to disabuse themselves of that. There are many other ways. There are ways for us to project our power by being involved in the national security apparatus here, by helping to shape foreign policy. And why I think it's so important for veterans to be involved in that space is because we can hold other veterans accountable. We can hold the executive accountable. I hear comments that give me pause. You and I talked about this. When I hear people say, you shouldn't get into an argument with a four star, I reject that comment. <laughs> I reject that because this is a democracy and we should be able to hold our leaders accountable in a democracy. 
And so whereas civilians may feel at times a little reticent to get into this dynamic engagement with a military senior leader, other veterans are not because they know our lives are at stake and our families' lives are going to be impacted by these decisions. So I want more veterans to be involved in the, in the foreign policy decision making back here as well. You know, you, you've spent quite a bit of time in both the private and the nonprofit sector. You're in the private sector now. How, how do you see that? And then Meg, when you get a chance to jump in, really interested to hear on how you see that impact in the healthcare mm -hmm. sector. Uh, so I think that the, the curve, if you want to look at the, the list of total available opportunities to make an economic impact on sort of a, a bell curve, I think that we tend to really uh, lionize people that are at either end of the curve, so to speak, in terms of the opportunities. And so there are a lot of veterans and there are a lot of people out tackling enormous problems, you know, international problems, clean water, AIDS, uh, immigration, huge issues. And I think that's absolutely where we need some of our best and brightest veterans. And then you see other veterans, what I would, I would call the other end of the curve, working on uh, technology, innovation, you know, social platforms, things that are, again, mm -hmm. they're very recognizable and they're lionized for their, their, you know, their pioneering vision in business. Um, I think what we miss too often though, and not that both those things aren't great and important, but I think under the fat part of the curve is a tremendous opportunity to get into uh, service industry businesses, small business, local business. I mean, there are hundreds of millions of Americans out there that don't really care to have a better app for where to find dinner and maybe they, it doesn't impact their life directly about a clean water well in East Africa, but they have a million problems that need to be solved for them on where they buy groceries, how they get to work every day, infrastructure, local politics, all those things. And so I, I certainly don't want to sit here and um, say that we shouldn't be going after the, the ends of the curve, but I think that veterans should be looking for ways to contribute to businesses and opportunities that serve the biggest number of people in their community, in their state, and in the country. And so that might be buying a plumbing business from a 55-year-old that's getting ready to retire. That might be starting a small business or restaurant on the, on the corner of your, of your street. But I just think the, the opportunity is enormous out there for people that are energetic and hungry and smart to go uh, carve out their way. And then if it, if it grows big and it explodes and they become famous, that's great. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you have to uh, necessarily be on the cover of Wired magazine to be making a, a big difference in the economic impact toward our country.